On today's episode, we talk about personal growth amongst COVID. We join Stacey Abrams for, for All In, Fight for Democracy. We have Alex Meneses of the Wall of Mexico and Manuel Del Valle here on The Zoo. Welcome to the zoo. These are my Zoopos, Nikki P and O Gabby. <laughs> a lot of things have been happening during COVID. Mm -hmm. Bad things, but also some personal growth, which brings us to today's big, big deal. deal. All right, so personal growth. Have you guys grown? Have you guys evolved? Have you guys, you know, expanded? I'm still the same me. Okay. I don't are plan you on growing. Okay, before, I, I want to get to some of your personal stuff. Wow, that's a really cool necklace. Oh, thank you. It's okay. from Germany. Oh, nice. Yeah. Um, Nikki, yes. how have you grown? How have you evolved? I, you know, I've become more accepting. Really? During this time. Accepting of what? People. You know, before, <laughs> just with social media, I really am. Before COVID, you know, you see these people on, on, on Facebook, I'm a model for who, the blind? You know, but now I, I, I've learned to be more accepting. It's, it's, it's a hard time, and I think that we all just need to be here for each other. So yeah. I'm, I'm more, you know, I'm not as judgmental maybe as I was but, before. Were you like a troll before? Did you troll people online? No, I just, I see these people that are like, I'm a model. I don't think so. I've seen your, you know. <laughs> You're fixated on it. I know, but he's fixated on people it who think they're a model. Is there anything else that bothers you on social, social media? How about yes. ignorant people that post fake on social media? I mean, social media has been very challenging during these times. You know, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm, I've been, to I've gone totally off of social media. You're I've taken off. my breaks. I, I barely go on Facebook anymore at all, at all. And then so now, even though I used to complain about Instagram, I think I, okay, now that I'm not on Facebook, I go on Instagram more, a little more than I used to. But really, I just scroll through. Makes and sense, that's it. dude. I sent you a message yesterday. You totally dissed it. No, I think I, m I messaged you back. No, you didn't. Yes, I did. I'm still waiting on that. I think I thought the I thought the response, and I forgot to write it down and press send. <laughs> when, why, so now you the intention was there. That's funny. <laughs> that's funny. Was no, there. sometimes I answer it in my head, and I forget to press send. No, so but I feel like it's been good. Like I yeah. never cooked before I started cooking. Oh, good. Yeah, I I have a George Foreman grill. Yeah, Thank you, George. So you know that was a big deal for me because I. Like, Belt. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> what about you? What about you? No, forget about me. What about, about your what personal about you? growth and your relationship? Let's talk about that. I'm not in a relationship, oh. but I'm dating, you know? Okay. I'm, I mean, you know. How do you date during COVID? We get, well, she's part of like the group that we've been hanging out with and we both got tested and then we're like, all right, you're not, you don't have COVID, I don't have COVID, so I guess we're making out. Oh, and then that's what sports No COVID, but positive happened. for gonorrhea. Oh, I know, I know. <laughs> no, but I want, okay, so are you still dating the guy that we were dating last oh, year? Oh, why do you have to bring it up? No. Okay, so how long have you been single? Six months. And how has it been? It's been tough. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. It's been tough because, like, usually pre-COVID, you know, you get to go out and distract yourself, hang out with your girls, go out for some drinks, and now it's like you sit with all the feelings and you really feel everything. But you guys, you no, guys but broke up. Like, okay, but hold on. <laughs> you guys broke up around the beginning of COVID. Then. Literally, the weekend where it was like, all right, lockdown, y'all staying home. That's when he was like, doopsies. <laughs> but were you guys living together? No, 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 we never lived together. But like, I, how did that spur? Like, hey, wait a minute, I don't want to be locked down with you. Is that like that? No, no, no. We weren't together during the lockdown. We were in our separate homes during lockdown. But the breakup happened during the beginning. But was it because you guys thought you couldn't see each other? No, I mean, I'm not gonna get so into it. But um, it just like led up. I, I felt like it was leading up to it and it exacerbated it the issues listen the next guy that you're with is the guy you're gonna marry that's what they told me about this guy and i really <laughs> thought it was gonna happen how no, long yeah, did you guys go know, out um it's funny six months we were supposed to be a year like two days ago wait you yeah. broke you've been broken up by six months but you had only gone out with six months well i knew him for six years Nikki, so get in a, here. It's, it's a little, you know, it's different when you know someone for that long though okay so uh, maybe we i was dating together. somebody at the beginning of covid and <sighs> was it the God. earwax guy if this is, <laughs> no, but this is somebody who didn't wear deodorant. So anybody that has any oh, problems with bodily natural. functions, love me. Yeah, and I feel like it was at the beginning of COVID, like we didn't know what was going on. It was very scary. He wasn't wearing a mask. You know, it was just bad. I was like, who else? He was like, I'm going on dog walks with other people. You know, I'm not taking the yeah. chance. Yeah. Yeah. You don't yeah. know where their dogs have been. No. And now you're walking everyone's dog. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I don't yeah. need to get fleas. <laughs> I know. I know. Oh my gosh. But how has um, dating been for you? I mean, do you like? I mean, I kind of like you don't have to see people as much now. It's like let's FaceTime. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, in, in the beginning, I went on a, a bunch of like uh, Zoom dates that somebody was setting me up on, and and I did do like a social distance dog walk with a girl that I met. How do you do Can that? I ask you? We, well, we, we Wait, walked outside. Like, She's you're like, outside. No, you then... just you walk and you're just not like close to me. You're outside. It's windy. Oh, I, I mean, I don't want to be like, oh, Umberto's a loose goose. But if you're outside and you're, you know, it's a little, I mean, here it's a little like, oh, man. 
mm. I have to ask you, on the Zoom dates, yeah. do you have to Zoom Pro? Or when 40 minutes wraps up, you're like, you know what? Because Well, we're not Zoom recording. Only... We're not oh, recording. So is. you can take it, you know, I think Zoom Pro is no, so that you cuts... can record more than oh, 40 minutes. But it, oh, but I, no, it cuts, I've been on Zoom as a cutoff after 40 minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. which is perfect for a date if I don't like them. I'm like, oh. Well, I would have been like, 30 minutes, Down we're out. your account. <laughs> so if you're not That's interested, hilarious. you're like, oh, well, there's our 40 minutes. Good luck. Well, let's talk about not even dating. Can we just enjoy just like not dating at all? I think it's been really nice. I, I don't I, look. I don't like dating. I've never. Dated. I like sex. Like, yeah. Oh. The dating <laughs> is required to get the sex. Because uh, because I, I don't I don't well I, I don't hang around girls that just have sex with you without dating. Well then you're looking at the wrong Zoom calls because there's girls out there that will do it. I'm not saying I will do it, but I know that girls do do that. Listen, if I, when I was, in my younger days, I would have been like, can you introduce me to some? But I'm not there anymore. So. <laughs> I see, I, I like dating only because I don't like to pay for my own meals. So that's the benefit for me. Like, the sex now. could come after, right? I am a chef now. I'm like Chef Boyardee. But, uh, yeah. you know, but I feel like if, I'm gonna, if we're going to pork, I, I need to know that you're going to pick up the dinner at Red Lobster or wherever we choose to eat. Okay, I was gonna go one way, but when you mentioned Red Lobster, when I was a kid, I remember like I used to like enjoy going to like Red Lobster, Sizzler, like all you can eat shrimp. Have you guys been to any yeah. one of those places recently? Mm -mm. Yeah, the okay. cheddar biscuits. I... That cheddar biscuits. <laughs> Wait, going back to your, because we have like one minute before going out to uh, okay. commercial, going out to like your recovery. We'll call it your recovery post your relationship. It, it is definitely a half. I feel like I'm at a better place right now than I Good. was. You're learning months. a lot. But you're uh -huh. also, you're, you're also, I've been seeing like on Instagram your spiritual pictures. You're like at the desert, you're in a spring, you know, you're like, I'm spring. Okay, so what, that, that's been your therapy? It has been my therapy. I mean, I've always loved traveling and, and it's something that has always been an escape, but this time it wasn't an escape to escape my reality. It was just like, I deserve to go out, yeah. you know, and like just be free and find myself again because I went through the cycle of the breakup and now I feel like I'm in a place where, okay, I'm Gabby again. Let's find the Gabby that kind of got lost in the relationship and find her again and grow into some other type of Gabby. I don't know. Total Gabby. Did you cry a lot? Uy, todavía let's lloro all, a veces. Okay, let's all cry together really quick. Ready? <laughs> <laughs> I can't cuss, right? But like, I cry and cuss a lot. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we're gonna go out to commercial. <laughs> when we come back, uh, you know, Maria's gonna talk to somebody about this amazing documentary called All in a Fight for Democracy about the amazing Stacey Abrams. Just you. keep it locked here in the zoo. We're gonna keep crying on this I'll commercial. I'll talk to you guys later, bye. <laughs> <laughs> We are back Yay! and we're happy, we're alive, we feel good. Hey, 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 hey. <coughs> that Audio wasn't COVID. Me. That wasn't COVID. That's because they streamed. That's not my that mask. That's because they streamed. Shoot. Hold up. Wear your mask for this one. All right, guys. Um, uh, Maria uh, talked to some peeps for us uh, about this documentary called All In, The Fight for Democracy. Um, you guys know about voter suppression, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, so uh, there's a lot of, uh, mainly the Republicans are trying to keep certain people from voting, people that should have the right to vote. Um, like, I think, like, the felons don't have the right to vote. I'm sorry, you go to jail, fine, but you still get to vote. Of course. Like, give me a break. Um, but, yeah, she, you know, so Stacey Abrams is a big advocate for uh, fighting voter suppression, making sure that everybody that can vote has access to, to voting and, and all that kind of stuff. So, um, do you guys have any questions? <laughs> I'm excited. <laughs> I'm excited to see the piece. Uh, Everyone should be able to vote. Do you know who Stacey Abrams is? Yes. She ran for office in Georgia. Yep. Or Alabama. Right. Georgia. You should, yeah, I, I would not know. I honestly I would not know. I confuse it too sometimes. <laughs> um, and she was going to be the vice president uh, nominee, but then they, uh, they went with Kamala Harris, which is fine. But uh, do you, any questions? I'm excited. <laughs> Teacher, I have a lot of Go. questions. What? what do you do? Do you even know what voter suppression is? I, why do you talk to me like I'm stupid? Do you know what voter suppression is? I do, but it's not, it? uh, look, I'm not very involved with politics. <laughs> okay. I don't like talking about so politics. I'm not going to lie. Okay, but I that's fine. Really like Let me that's fine. Because you know what? The, these days, sometimes it's like, oh, you got, you know, you, they but, shame people that are not super informed. It's like not everybody can be hooked on right the news. right now, everybody is being informed because everyone is at home and everybody, everything is being shoved out your face right now. Especially but are they with being the, informed with the right information? Eh, well, eso cierto. Ding, you know, you ding, gotta ding. Be, yeah, so let's find out some decent information from an awesome documentary all in the fight for democracy check it out i want to start by thanking you for doing this documentary because it, it is really a fight for a lot of us to get our voices heard and i want to know first how you two met and how when did you decided to to do this documentary or if you can tell me a little bit well sure it started with stacy abrams um stacy abrams uh 
you know, and founded this organization called Fair Fight. And she was committed to finding a way to make a documentary about the history of voting rights. She didn't want a documentary about her, her race, about any one political party or candidate, because at the end of the day, it's irrelevant. What's relevant is the hundreds of years of history, which has produced a moment, has produced an election like the 2018 Georgia gubernatorial election, where over 1.4 million people were purged from the rolls, where uh, you know lines were, you know, polling places didn't have equipment for people's votes to be counted, where the Secretary of State, the man who is making the rules of the election was her opponent. I mean, it was a it was a perfect storm. But if you just look at that one story, you're not seeing the whole big picture because there have been hundreds of years in the making towards creating this current moment. Um, Lisa and I uh, knew each other as colleagues, um, and I had a great deal of respect from her for making her film, uh, The Apollo, about the Apollo theater and other films she'd worked on. So um, called her up and we... Uh, I think she she liked the idea too. <laughs> you know, so from from the very beginning, there was always some laws that they were designed to suppress certain population, the rights to vote. While doing the documentary, there were some of these laws that surprised you that you didn't you weren't aware of them, or did you find something while doing the documentary that like shocked you? Well, I, I think it's you know, we look at the inception of our country and only 6% of the population, white male land owners could vote. And so you see that entrenched in the constitution is actually language that not everyone can has the right to vote. So it isn't surprising, it's just one, how long progress takes, but also through time, how the, the movement to restrict the vote takes on a different face. You know, as Liz mentioned, it might be, you know, poll closures or purges that are happening now. And, you know, if we were to go back in time, it is the literacy test. But, at you know, we can look at the parallels now of where there's talk of having law enforcement at the polls and then the parallel with, you know, the intimidation that African-Americans and other people of color uh, encountered with the bully clubs and the dogs, you know, intimidation of a different face, but with the same purpose. Thank you. Thank you so much for doing this. This is this is really good for everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. When we come back to the zoo, we're gonna have our guest, Alex Meneses from the Wall of Mexico. Keep it locked. We are back on the zoo and we have a very special guest, Alex Meneses. Hey. Hi, welcome, welcome. She's a beautiful half Mexican, half Ukrainian actress. Mm -hmm. And she's one of the stars of the, of the movie Wall of Mexico. Yes. yes. Very excited, guys. It opens tomorrow at a theater near you, but I don't know what that means. Well, so it's, it's like, like, it's like, like a too, right? With COVID, it's like a we have no idea what that means. Check your GPS. Theater, yeah, drive-in or something, but we are VOD on October 13th, so check it out. Um, can I ask you guys your names? Because I don't know yeah. them. Oh, yeah, I'm Gabby. Gabby? I'm Umberto. Umberto. Ooh. I'm Nikki. Hi, Nikki. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> so, like, we we all like are gonna serve different emotional needs in, throughout this interview, right? Okay. Yeah. So, you know, we'll, you'll figure out who's who as we go along. But let's get back to the favorite at the end. <laughs> yeah, let's get back to the move. So, what's the Wall of Mexico about? So, um, um, on the surface, it's this very sexy, uh, drug-filled crazy um, movie about these and entitled girls who are my daughters played by Marisol Sacramento and Carmela Zumbado who are mm. amazing. Um, Isai Morales and I play their parents mm. and the family is this very wealthy, very well-educated, beautiful family that never ages. Dun, dun, dun. Tell me the secret. Okay, so um, I mean it is, it's a statement um, by our directors who are um, Zachary Kotler and uh, Magdalena Sychek. It's a political statement actually um, about what's happening all over the world. The, the Mexican-American debacle, the you know, India-Bangladesh wall, the refugees in Europe. It's mm -hmm. this, it's a metaphor 
for what's happening. And when there's so much political rife, I mean, what do you do? You feel helpless. Mm -hmm. And so this is where uh, they thought um, media plays a big, uh, it's, it's a big help because everyone watches TV and film and it's so impactful. So you know, let, the, I, I want to understand the plot a little bit better because there's, there seems like this, there's mysticism involved too. They, there's yeah. a well on the property yes. that people think or the family thinks is keeping them young. And then people start coming to steal the water. Yes. Okay. Have you seen it? Well, I've seen Have you seen it? <laughs> I usually read a little bit about the guests before they come on. <laughs> but have no, you seen I haven't seen it yet, but I saw You I've, haven't seen it yet? No, no, no. Thanks. I want to. Okay. I, it looks yeah. like you took a shot from the well before you got here. Because you look literally <laughs> amazing. It's, you know, it's in the genes. I have greasy skin. I'm a Mexican. What do you want? <laughs> <laughs> That's the trick. Oily skin. Oily skin. Oily skin. Oily skin. Oily skin. Oily skin. Yeah. yeah, I hated it as a teenager, but now I'm like, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Where are the oil droplets? But it is, so it's this beautiful story um, that's kind of an allegory that puts that's a blanket over this all these situations that are happening but it's metaphorically speaking it's about the wall of Mexico mm. so because we have this fountain of youth on the property and people are stealing it Eastside decides to make a wall around our villa mm. and um, it's the villa is somewhere in California in the desert and the locals call us the Mexicans oh you work in Mexico and um, so that's why it's called the wall of Mexico to keep out it's sort of the have and haves not have nots right. to keep out the people that don't have it and so we sort of represent that entitled spoiled well-educated uh, person that American maybe and how do the how do the how do your two daughters in the in the film uh, what, what their their story involves I, I know one of them is, is helping to protect the the, the well but what, what happens with them um, well, it's, it's basically how they torment our new handyman played by, um, oh my God, Jackson. Rathbone. Rathbone. <laughs> From Twilight. Dreamboat. Yes. Total dreamboat. So he's our new handyman and they kind of torment him because they're sexy and they're in their bathing suits all the time. They're always doing cocaine and they're so smart and beautiful. And he's like, blah, 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 blah. and, um. <laughs> Is the handyman helping build the wall? He's the handyman who helps um, on our property, the new guy. Okay. And so he's like, what is going on? These people don't age and these girls are crazy and why are they here? And you know, it's, it's, it's got that creepy aspect. And um, so we've, we basically followed the, what happens with the girls and how they represent um, American society. Mm. I like the fact that the people that are representing American society are Mexican American characters. Yeah, because that well, the talent. That I like. It's layer within layer within, within layer, layer within, within layer. layer. Well, you know, I mean, uh, uh, Latinos make up what thirty-seven point five percent of the population now. I heard thirty-seven point six by this morning. Oh. Oh. <laughs> and it'll change by tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it always goes up. It always goes up. Now, one thing I love about in the film, you play a matriarch that will do anything to protect her family. Yes. Yeah. So what do you have to protect them from? What are people doing to the wall? Nah, nah, nah. Okay, you have to watch. Okay. Um, so I am the major. <laughs> She's given away enough. <laughs> I have given away the whole She's like, movie, Buy a basically. <laughs> <laughs> um, I am the uh, matriarch in the family, and I handle the business side of everything. And uh, yeah, I protect my girls from anything and anyone that could possibly hurt them, just like any mommy. Right. Mm -hmm. Mama bear. Uh, what was Isai, Isai Morales is, uh, is a, I consider him a friend. Um, I've seen him cry many times, not on, not on camera, on his roles. I'm talking about in life, on the right, on his, on the right home. I, sometimes I took him home to the party and he's just crying. <laughs> he does Hi. that, he just cries. He just cries. It, uh, what was he like on set? Did, was, did, he, did you guys need to take away like coffee and, and just being like, all right, just calm down Isai. Isai is hilarious, hilarious. It was very difficult to work especially when we were doing like serious scenes and uh, what are these townspeople doing and uh, with Isai making like fart noises in the background. Were, are you sure they're fart noises? <laughs> yeah, they yeah. were. Were they you were. sure? <laughs> uh, he's hilarious, he's a wonderful guy. And um, we shot this movie in Tecate, Mexico oh, wow. oh. with a crew from Tijuana who oh. were top notch, fantastic, amazing. Wow. And uh, you know now that in Mexico and uh, Tecate and then in, in Bajas, this, um, there are vineyards, mm. all these vineyards. So I didn't go because I'm, I'm old and I can't drink anymore. No. But um, 
You just that, can't that drink anymore. That didn't stop Esai, <laughs> but Esai okay. took the girls and they went wine winery hopping no. uh, for a day, and we didn't see them for a few days. But <laughs> <laughs> they never showed up on set. <laughs> That's how the movie ends. No, I, I know. I, I, I keep on telling Esai, you're not young anymore. If you're gonna drink a lot today, you're gonna need a day to recover. You're not just gonna be. Oh, no, I got it. I got it. I got it. And then he starts crying. Again. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we gotta get him some Pedialyte. We do. We need some to get him back on the set. <laughs> well, uh, you know, he's playing the new villain in Mission Impossible. Really? Yeah. He's Good for him. He's filming right now in Norway. Oh, he's a, he makes a good villain. He makes a great villain. Yeah. He's going to be great. He well, you know what I want? I want after, you know, I, when he comes back to the States after Mission Impossible, I need to convince him to run for office, political <laughs> office. Well, I'm going to write him in. He's crazy enough. Okay. You know? <laughs> he is crazy enough. And that, and by the way, we can say he's crazy enough to almost anything. If I say something about Isai, he's crazy enough. All right, we're going to take a break, and we're going to come back with our new bestie, Alex Meneses from the Wall of Mexico. We're going to learn a little bit more about your life. Okay. Yeah. Keep it locked right here on the zoo. We are back here on the zoo with our friend Alex Meneses, uh, one of the stars of The Wall of Mexico, which is an amazing fi film. I haven't seen it yet, but the way you described it, like, I gotta get seat, you know, gotta get a seat. I'm going to the drive up theater. Let's do it, the yeah. drive in. Oh. But I like to yeah, drive up. Right? Yeah. Go see it tomorrow night at a theater near you. Well, October 13th is when it drops on VOD. Yes. yes. Okay, so that's maybe that's, the more important date since one. we're gonna be repeating a that's little bit. That's the one. Um, let's talk about you for a little bit. You're from Chicago. Born and raised in Chicago. Okay, and so you're half Mexican, half Ukrainian. Yes. I see the I see the, the mixture of Mexican and Eastern European. You do. Okay. That's amazing. Yeah. You're like a tan Eastern European. <laughs> You're a brown Eastern European. That's what I that's what I get a lot at my church. Everyone's like looking at me like mm, and then they're really like, oh yeah, yeah. So yeah. You, what's the difference you think between the Mexican community in the Midwest and the Mexican community maybe out here in Southern California? Um I th I think that there are a lot more immigrants in Chicago than I see here. I see a lot of a uh, third, fourth, right. fifth generation really? um, Latinos here, Mexicans here, um, like in like in Miami, mm -hmm. and in Chicago there are there is just a, a huge immigrant population. Mm -hmm. Wow! Like how did you guys get here? That. I didn't yeah, realize. But I in Chicago, right? But I mean, because whenever you think of the Midwest, you think uh, you think of it as more white, right? Except for maybe the big cities, Chicago, Detroit, you mm -hmm. know. Right. But but Chicago is very mixed. In. My, I've never been to Chicago, but when my dad first came from uh, Cuba, well, he spent one year in Mexico and then he came to Chicago for a couple of years. They were like, "This is way Peter too Pan? cold." He wasn't a Peter Pan, no, but uh, but he did have to cross over first, and then the, he was claimed. There was a whole story claimed right. by the family. But then when my grandfather, his dad, uh, made it to Miami, they linked up with the family. They went. They, he got a job in Chicago, but he loved Chicago. They lived on the South Side. Uh huh. That's so, right. So, That's where I'm from. Well, hey. my, my dad and his brother got beat up every day. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> the only Cuban kids. <laughs> yeah. So uh, what, do you, what, do you, what do you think? What makes Chicago Chicago? Ah, uh, food. The pizza. Food. Sausages. Yes, sausages. That's sausages. Pizza. <gasps> just food. I mean, I go home, um, and you go to a restaurant, and they'll give you your dinner, and it's like, <clears throat> and it's, it's like a dinner for four people. Honestly, people are hardy in Chicago. People are hardy. It's cold, you know. So you gotta, you gotta beef up. You gotta beef up and, <laughs> and eat the all the. You don't want to blow away. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and so you gotta, you gotta eat a lot. People eat a lot. They, en they enjoy going out, eating. Um, it's a big city, but it's a big city where people live. Right. And uh, it's not as spread out as L.A. L.A. is just. So so spread out. It's like a bunch of suburbs and, and like it's sort cleaner. Of, it's cleaner. It's cleaner. It's very clean for a big city. It's like a clean. Oh, I'm gonna get in trouble for this. Less sophisticated New York. Mm. I, I see. I see trouble. a blend of New York and LA put together with Chicago. Yeah. I've been to Chicago. I've been to New York, and I live in LA, and I'm from LA, and I'm like, hmm. Do I like deep dish more than New York pizza? Do I? Do we even have a style of pizza out here in LA? Uh. Pizza Hut? Bitch. No. <laughs> Pizza I think, Hut? I think, I think California is more like a burger. Uh, 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 in like, and out. Like, and burritos. Yeah. I think burritos. Mm. Yes. Burritos out here burritos too. Burritos and yeah. burgers, yeah. But, I, you know, I, I like deep dish, but it's a lot. Oh, my gosh. You can't move afterwards. Yeah. You cannot move. But, you know, when I was living and growing up in Chicago as a teenager, I could probably eat two or three deep dish slices. Now, Show off. So good. <laughs> How'd you get into acting? Uh, I Aside was from people in, saying this face has to be on camera. Uh, I, you know, I don't, I don't remember that growing up. I, except for my family, but we were the only Mexican um, family in my neighborhood. 
And so the cops, I mean, the neighbors are calling cops on us all oh, the time. Oh. oh, your kids are on my grass. and the, yeah. Really? Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. It was insane. The music is too loud. It was, <laughs> oh, no, we didn't do that. Oh. But, um, no, but the fact that they would be like, you know, your kid is on my lawn and, and, and she's Mexican, so we're going to call the cops. That's awful. That's crazy. Wow. Yeah, it was real. That was real. But my aunt had the dance studio, the neighborhood dance studio. So I would dance since I was three. Wow. And she got me an agent when I was a teenager, and I would start going on auditions. She was a stage mother. I didn't even think about acting. I didn't know I was going to be an actress, and then I started to be an actress. Wow. <laughs> I love you and everybody loves Raymond. Oh, thank Brad, you. Can I tell you, I have a crush on Brad Garrett. I feel very close to you. I don't tell blame you. you. I would like to be his girlfriend if I, I could. I don't blame you. How was that I experience? I was his girlfriend. Um, it, was, it was fantastic because the first episode that we did was shot in Italy. So wow. the whole production, you know, went to Italy. It was a big successful show that had a lot of network money. So they took everybody to Italy for two weeks. Wow. And Phil Rosenthal, speaking of food, Phil Rosenthal is a real foodie. He has a show mm -hmm. now on Netflix, right. uh, Eating with Phil. Yep. And um, every night we'd go to the best restaurant that they could find and w eat way too much delicious Italian food. And it was f fabulous. I mean, I'm hanging out in Italy with Ray Romano and Brad Garrett, laughing my ass off and, um, you know, doing this wonderful show that was beautifully written and it was it was a dream how amazing yeah. but you're not only an actress you're a philanthropist yes yes you are doing everything so you have anything going on right now during covid i know a lot of people well, have like it's it's really i'm on the board of trustees at children's hospital oh, of okay. los angeles and i have been for 15 years so i'm a i raise money and i'm a really good money raiser i'm a shark when I can raise money for somebody else. I can't really ask for myself, but um, <laughs> <laughs> only jewelry. But um, <laughs> when I want, uh, raising money for sick kids, it's a no-brainer. It's, oh. it's easy. And uh, Children's Hospital is the only pediatric uh, hospital in Los Angeles, which means it only deals with children. It's not like a hospital and has like a little wing of Children's Hospital. It is um, a teaching hospital. We are in cahoots with USC, and it is the most mm. fabulous place. If any of you want to take a tour, please let me know, yeah. and you can take a tour. I will, I will give you a tour. How You're, can we contribute? How it can will we change yeah. your life. Yeah. Uh, go on to their website, uh, childrenshospital.org, and um, give money. Can we all, do they also need like entertainment? Because like, I think the three of us could go in there. We can do a little song and dance. You know, they they the need they need everything right now. It's a little difficult with COVID. Ah, uh, yeah, that's oh, right. Yeah. And we had our big big um, uh, event scheduled in October that we had to cancel. It was our big fundraiser where we raised just millions of dollars. Um, wow. Yeah, it's it's an amazing place. So that's been my baby before my baby for a long time. Um, but you're also <laughs> the, on the board of directors for a few other charities as well. You do work with animals as well. Yes, yes. I'm not anymore. When now you sleep. <laughs> <laughs> right? I know you look so beautiful. Like it looks like you're doing so many things, and it's like you're never aging. Oh, this because I drink the water. It's the water. <laughs> Wall of Mexico. <laughs> the water from the well. Fountain of Youth. So <laughs> I'm drinking the water. Um, I'm off of a lot of boards now because I have a daughter. Right. And as my father said, and as I believe, charity starts at home. Taking care of starts at home. So I gave up a lot of things when my daughter came into my life, when I adopted my daughter. And so, yeah, it's but basically children's hospital. Well, no, but I, you know, I, I, you know, because I don't have kids, but I, I have friends who have kids, and them putting, you know, love and wisdom into their kids and then sending their kids out in the world, that's the ultimate contribution. That's it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we got to run. I want to thank you for being here. Come by and hang out with us. I can't wait to see the wall of Mexico. Can you bring some of that yes. water for us here? Yes. You know, no, you guys don't need it. Oh, you know. you're so pretty. <laughs> That's amazing. We are back here on the zoo with our yes. new friend, filmmaker Manuel Del Valle, the director of Nahum. Nahum. I it's love the name. I just want to like, say, um, beautiful movie. I saw some of the promotional material that is visually amazing. Tell us Thank a little you. bit about the story. Thank you. Well, Nahum translate to, translates to family. Mm -hmm. it's, um, the film is a family drama that and takes... In what language? The Nahuatl? Uh, no, it's, it's actually a made-up language. It's okay. a fictional language that we work with uh, Carlos Barona and our colleagues back in Mexico. 
-hmm. and we spent a couple of months like figuring out the culture and the language and getting inspiration from different cultures mm -hmm. and especially nature sounds mm -hmm. and that's what, how we came up with the whole um, atmosphere and the whole um, speech of these characters. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, so um, what was the question again? Oh, then tell us about the story. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, it's a family drama that takes, pa takes place on, on, on prehistoric era. It's basically a film about uh, a family, um, two male members, the father, um, the partner, of, and, and a woman who's very sick. Uh, throughout this journey, because they're looking for a mythical source of life, the uh, egos of their male members starts, start to rise to the surface as they fight for power. Mm. So the when worst. do they not? <laughs> <laughs> so it's basically a story, it's a universal story set in a prehistoric era, so I think it's, it's creates a lot of conversation. I love the fact that it's set in a prehistoric era, like, you know, there, there, there's, because you, you get down to the nitty, like the, the fundamental aspects of human nature. Because sometimes society, modern society, is so complex and nuanced that things get lost. But really, back then, there was family, survival. The power was very obvious, who's leading, who's not. Um, wh tell us about the motivation to set it in that time to be able to tell this story. Oh, yeah, no, definitely. I mean, I, I guess the, the whole idea of, of allowing ourselves to, first of all, uh, film in this amazing location, San Luis Potosí, it's uh, La Huasteca Potosina. Where, and that's in Mexico? And that's in Mexico. What part? Uh, it's San Luis Potosí, it's right in the center of Mexico. Yeah, because it's, I, I mean, from what I saw, the images, they're a very thick forest, it's not, in, in, it doesn't take space like in the desert in the north. Oh no, it yeah. was a very hard locations to yeah. film on. Yeah. Uh, but that was one of the reasons why we, we, we decided to make a prehistoric piece. And the other one, my collaborator, Sebastián Torres, he's a good friend of mine and he's the co-director. He came with, he came to me with a very beautiful script, which I thought was very universal. But at the same time, I really like uh, the whole essence of of how timeless um, the human ego can be, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, we did not define in a specific time or in a specific era. We were deciding to make it into an actual culture, but then we wanted to be respectful and not misinterpret any other cultures and kind of just like dive into this um, very interesting process of making the culture, which is inspired by the theme. Uh, as you can see, the characters have these very huge masks yeah. uh, made out of wood and and there's a hierarchy to them. The bigger the horns made out of uh, sticks, the more of a, um, o, 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 the more ego the character has, you know? So the whole theme and the language and the whole idea of putting it in a prehistoric time, um, it all comes back to the themes, the, the, the ego of the, uh, of the human being, right? So what are they fighting about? The, uh, you said that one is the, um, the partner of the sick woman and who's the other uh, man that fights? The father. The, the father. father of the, so yeah. so the husband and the father of this woman yeah are fighting over um, how to save some, her something that I cannot really reveal okay. I would love for people to watch the film <laughs> but but it's it's related to um, the whole idea of having heritage the whole idea of, of leaving a legacy behind you know so it kind of if if you watch the film closely uh, there's several things that I think reflect to issues that are happening today mm -hmm. you know. So yeah, I, that's why uh, I thought it was very interesting to have these two clashing characters discussing over the future of this woman, which I think is very relevant nowadays. And when does the film come out? Uh, the film is currently in Film Festival Circuit. Okay. Um, right now, uh, as of today, we're having a Q&A tonight at Hola Mexico Film Festival. Awesome. Um, wow. in, a, in a week, we're gonna be in the New York Latino Film Festival, um, yeah. sponsored by HBO, and we just got a very amazing news New Filmmakers LA and the Academy of Motion Picture and, and, and Arts and Sciences, it's, it's going to be projecting Nahum along other um, Latino short films in the, for the um, Hispanic uh, Latino Heritage Month. Uh, so we're going to be screening at an Academy event, and that's very, very amazing. We're Yay, very excited. Congratulations. Nice, congratulations. I want to ask you, on this, what is it like on set? Is it is intense? On camera, as it is off camera, it was very intense, especially yeah. because we 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 did rehearsals on, on on a room with the characters. We went to the location, Scott. But once you get these costumes on the on these amazing actors, and and you are in these harsh look harsh locations, you start to feel the the truthness of the atmosphere that you are involved, right? Uh, I mean, we had fake uh, sweat for the actors at the beginning, but suddenly they started sweating for real, you know. <laughs> so this. These entire harsh atmospheres that the characters are on are literally happening in, around them. So 
it was not my first time shooting in a jungle or shooting in in, uh, in harsh locations, but it was definitely the biggest crew that I've had in such unique place, you know? So let's, La Huasteca really shines Let's talk there. about your writing process, because I read somewhere where you like to role play when you're writing I, your stuff. I do, I do a lot. So how did, how did you oh get man, involved you with... did your research. I sure did, I was like, okay, let me look him up. No, right. I want to know, like, how I, do you... I, I, I like to do that. Um, in, this, in this process, I did that with uh, my co-director, Sebastian. Um, he's an amazing writer as well. But I, I tend to like the nature of, like, just putting myself in the actor's shoes or the character's shoes and understanding the other side of the coin, which is kind of just existing on a character. I tend to record myself sometimes just like monologuing as a character and, and, and sometimes I even forget that I'm recording myself and you, you get into the character and then you come back to these recordings that you have and you kind of like start digging into what moments you felt uh, were felt true to the nature of the character, right? So I do, I, I do like to role play. I don't consider Beautiful. myself a good actor, but I, I like to role play while writing. That'll help you creatively and with some certain ladies. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, every time, yeah, the term role play now sometimes evokes other, other thoughts, but that, that's All right. interesting. <laughs> but definitely, you know, uh, and did you write, okay, was the script written in, in, in English or Spanish first and then trans translated was, into it, this uh, language you created? Yeah, um, it's, it's called Tejkum, the language. We even give it a title, right? Wow. Uh, we, we wrote in Spanish. We okay, wrote in so there's Spanish. a Spanish script, so you know what the person's trying to say, but then it's like, all right, now we got to change these, you know, yeah. Spanish uh, dialogue. Into another language. And I'm going to be very honest, and this is, I'm going to give a, a huge secret away. Some of the lines of dialogue, because of course we have to subtitle it, ended up changing in the editing room, you know? You feel like the story needs more context, so that was kind of like an interesting liberty to have yeah, this you made of language. Yeah, you change the lines after. And, yeah. and, and we did it for one or two lines, we, we change the lines because, you know, as they say, you never stop writing. Right. Even in the editing yeah. right. room, you're writing, right? All right, we're going to take a break, and we're going to come right back with Manuel Del Valle, the director of Nahum. Nahum. Thank you Keep very much. Keep it like on the We are back here in the zoo uh, with filmmaker Manuel Del Valle. So I, ha I have a question now. So you co-directed this, right, with your yes. friend Sebastian? Yes. And who's the, who was the writer? Who was the original writer of the script? Um, Sebastian uh, came to me with a very beautiful script. And you guys ended up writing it, uh, finishing it together? And then we ended up finishing and it together. And you ended up r directing this movie together? Yeah, I joined as a writer, and then I kind of evolved into noticing that this, 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 we were both very close to the narrative. So here's, here's a question, because art imitates life, life imitates art that these two men, males, uh, at any point did ego get in between the two of you? Mm. Reflecting what you were gonna decide to do with this female character that you guys are writing about. <laughs> did you guys reflect some of the issues that you're writing about in the film? It's definitely a process. Uh, co-writing or co-directing with a person was my first time that I did it. Um, I have a lot of respect for Sebastian. He was the first, we actually, we became very good friends as I met him because I met him throughout making the film. And now he's my roommate and he lives here in LA. He moved uh, to, to make more films. And there was definitely moments where I was like, no, I, we need to take this character this way. And he was like, no, we need to take it that way. But I think that's kind of like the beauty of creative differences because you find a place in the middle, you know? And um, I, I think out of the, the entire film, the thing that I'm most grateful for is that, I mean, I met this amazing, talented person that now is one of my best friends. And we have been collaborating for like five projects together now. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes I'm producer, sometimes he's a producer and I direct, et cetera, et cetera. But I think that's kind of like the whole beauty of working with new people in this medium. You tend to like make new friendships and right. build each other up. You Who know? do you think Smash would have more sticks on it? Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> He's probably going to be watching this, so I'll say <laughs> him. It's all about honesty in a relationship. But I love how, how you can get something from the art you're creating yes. and realize, wait a minute, hold on, this lesson that I'm trying to bestow, I'm actually going through it myself in a, in a small way, you know, working with someone else and not letting ego get in the way. I, you I'm going to tell you something. He kept the bigger mask. Oh. <laughs> he kept the bigger mask. Male the egos, man, I'm telling you. <laughs> yeah. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Where are you from? I'm from San Luis Potosí, Mexico. Oh. I, I moved to San Francisco like four years ago, and then I, I decided that the whole uh, experimental film pro the, the experimental film process was not my thing. I'm really into narrative film, so I decided to come here to LA. Right. And where does your nickname come from? 
¿La puedo decir? Yeah, yeah, Pelón del not? Valle. Pelón Where del does Valle. that come from? Uh, it, it's, it's funny. I, I, from a very young age, I started losing my hair, and I, at the beginning, it's kind of like a, maybe considered like a tough thing to for a 15-year-old kid. But then it kind of just like grew on me, and it, it has become, it, it has become a. I feel like People call segment. it the director's look, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you do. Yeah, that's the director's look, and uh, yeah, that, that's how it came to be. Wow. That's amazing. That's amazing. <laughs> what inspired you when you were a young filmmaker? Oh, what inspired me? I, I was never in school. I was always uh, making films. I, I've, I went to school, but I was like going always out there and just like trying to make, make stuff. You know, I, I, I feel like I fell in love with theater first, but I've never done theater. It was just like as a kid, I, I grabbed my cousin and my friends and I tended to, to make this play for my family and they, they had to sit down to watch the entire thing, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and I scheduled them like, on Christmas, I'm gonna make a theater and then we, we uh, a play we, and we started rehearsing together. But I feel like I fell in love with making films before I fell in love with actually watching a ton of film. I, I grew up make, making a ton of films. Uh, I have a, like a bunch of stuff like just saved up on my drive that I, it's not out there anymore. It's, it's like films were like I was 13 year old when I was making those films. Wow. You should yeah. do like a whole like doc series, you know, with all of your stuff that you've done from 13 to now. Yeah, definitely. I, I, made a, I made a film that, I mean, I, I recorded throughout like, I don't know, two years of like every weekend. And, now most of it is lost, but if I look back to it, I was like 12 and I, I started thinking like I have made a feature film, it sucks, but I have made a feature film in a way, I don't know, the, the amount of weekends that I spent making those films and they were all kind of connected vaguely. Uh, I, now I think if I put all those, those clips together, um, it may be like two hours and a half long, you know? So, yeah. so that's kind of like, I made my first feature film, right. I, I, I guess, not officially, but. But yeah, yeah, I made a ton of film when I was a kid. I loved it. So what route would you give, like, for example, I have a cousin, he's around that age, like 12, 13, mm -hmm. that you started really like experimenting and realizing this is what I want to do. He's always asked me, how do I get into it? How do I start like directing? How do I start writing? And it's kind of just like, I don't know, I do the other side of the, of the industry. So someone like you, what would you advise a child at that age? How do you start getting involved? I. Uh, I believe you go by instinct a lot. You make for, for just for the sake of making, uh, because then you're gonna reach a time when, when there's a lot of pressure like of what the industry wants, what people want to see, what will get me into festivals, what will get me, you know? And when you're in that age, you're in the full liberty of thinking that you're just making it for the sake of making it. I am still am, and, and, and I love making film as, as, as a form of art and expression, but I, I believe just not having that pressure of, oh, I'm, 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 I'm studying and I need to graduate and have this and this and that and that, and just like enjoying the fact that even though it, it may take a long time for it's him, mm -hmm. he don't, it may take a long time for him to like actually eventually get to like make professional films. It's a good time for him to experiment and just make whatever he wants without any pressure in any, of any sort, you know? So I think that's a good advice. I, I think that kind of like, gives you a lot of liberty to find what you really want to do, you know? Awesome. Do, you, do you feel uh, inspired growing up by the fact that, um, you know, as, like the big three Mexican directors, that so much filmmaking talent has come out of Mexico the past couple of decades, you know, that it's, it's, it's becoming something that, you know, a, 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 a cultural export from the country that, you know, the filmmaking, uh, like how do you feel about that Mexican filmmaking heritage? Oh, no, definitely. I mean, I, I grew up hearing of these three huge figures. I recently started digging into, um, into another f Mexican filmmakers. I am a big fan of Ernesto Contreras and Carlos Contreras. Yeah. Um, Carlos uh, writes, Ernesto directs, and they have made some, such amazing films. And there's- Including, name a couple. Um, uh, Blue Eyelids, uh, Parpados Azules, Sueño Nuestro Idioma, which translates to I Dream in Another Language. Um, they are, they are amazing films, and I, and I believe there's a lot of talent out there, and I'm so glad that uh, these three huge directors are a beacon of inspiration, but, but there's a ton of filmmakers out there that are making a, a very great work, and I would encourage people to go outside of the, just like knowing the three big, which I admire, I love them, but the, Alejandra Marquez Abella, for example, she made uh, Niñas Bien, right. um, and that film was like one of the most, 
I don't know, just character driven pieces that I've seen in Mexican cinema in a long time. So mm. uh, she's very talented. She's actually from San Luis, so I'm very proud to say it every time that I say <laughs> it. So I'm just, because we, we got to wrap up right now, I just want to say that you're on the road to joining that pantheon of great Mexican filmmakers. Yeah. It's going to start with Nahum. Am I, am I saying it right? Nahum? Nahum. Nahum. Yeah. Nahum. Nahum. And uh, thank you for being on the show, man. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah. Everyone out there, follow it, look it up, and see where you can check it out. And good luck to you. Thank you very much. And when much. you do your next big film, you come to the zoo and let us know about great. it. Great. It was a pleasure us. being here. Thank <laughs> you, Manuel Del Valle, and thanks, Alex Meneses. Remember to follow us at LA TV Network across all social media and keep it locked all the time right here on The Zoo. The Zoo.